James is about real faith. James is about the kind of faith that actually works. Not a faith that is an internal decision that we make that's invisible to the world around us, but James is about a faith that is so infectious that once it gets a hold of your heart, it works its way out into every single area of your life. In fact, chapter one ends with this encouragement. If anyone considers himself religious. Now, the word religious isn't a great word to a lot of us because we, we don't consider ourselves religious. We consider ourselves faithful followers of Jesus. But James means that when he says religious here. So he's not talking about go to church, stand up, sit down, say the right thing, pray the right prayer, give the right amount of money, act religious. He's talking about people of faith in Jesus. If anyone considers himself, so can we just say that, a person of faith in Jesus, yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself or herself, and his faith in Jesus is worthless. See, that's James. James is like, oh, you go to Passion City Church? Oh, you're, you're in a community group? Oh, you're, you're a door holder? Well, you know what? Your tongue is burning down four relationships right now. Therefore, your Passion City Church, community group, blah, 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 that isn't worth anything. And no, thank you. I don't want to come with you to the 1145 gathering. And you're like, woo, man alive. We just got, got a little legalistic up in here. Like, no, we, we're just talking about real faith. James is not giving any of us a pass. He's not going, oh, that's cool. You're a follower of Jesus, but you just cut your coworker down in front of six other people. Man, that is making Jesus look really good at your company. Oh, no, no, it wasn't about Jesus. It was just, a, you know, the guy's a jerk. And everyone knows that. I mean, everybody agreed with, I mean, I mean it's not like I'm, I'm like saying something everybody doesn't already know. The guy is a punk. Well, if everybody already knew it, then probably wasn't any use in saying it again. And James is like right up in my grill. He goes on to say, this is the kind of followers of Jesus that God, our Father, accepts as pure and faultless. These are the kind of people God is going, yes, thank you, these are my followers. It's the ones who look after orphans and widows in their distress and those who keep themselves from being polluted by the world. So James is saying, don't give me a religion that's all show and no dough. Don't give me a religion that's all about the external and not about the internal. Here's what God wants. God wants people who don't burn down other people's lives with their tongues, and God wants people who see every widow and every orphan and move in their direction. Oh, and somebody who has a water treatment plant going on between the, the external world around them and their heart. God's looking for that person. That's James. So the next few weeks, get ready. Things are going to change in our lives in the next few weeks. But hello, this is the best part about the change in our lives. All of it is going to be stuff we want and need. And all of it is going to be the kind of change that the world around us has been waiting to see the church exhibit all this time. And so thank God and thank you, God, for the power of your word the power to change everything about our lives. When you talk about changing everything about our lives, this text we're jumping in today, it is crazy talk. Let's go. Verse two. <laughs> Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, maybe at... at 515, maybe you're still applauding. We can't hear you, so you're not piped in. I'll give you a minute just to let it kind of taper off slowly. People are cheering and probably shouting and th waving hankies and <laughs> high-fiving their neighbors. People are embracing and hugging each other and going, this is so great. I'm so glad we came. But it's pretty quiet over here at Cumberland. <laughs> Verse 2. 
We're two verses into this journey that we're on. And James, by the power of the Holy Spirit, says, hey, here's, here's where I'd like to start, okay? A, my life's been radically changed by my brother, who's not my brother. And I'm a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm writing to those of you who are now scattered out into the world. So that whole idea is that we're not all comfy, all holed up in Jerusalem anymore, but the persecution of Jerusalem is actually pushing the church out into the known world. And in light of that, here's where I'd like to begin. I want us to just absolutely consider it a big, big boatload of joy when we face all kind of different trials in our lives. And people are like, oh, okay. Not so sure I'm into that because that sounds like crazy talk to me. But what I'm learning about James is it's all crazy talk in a world that's upside down because God is trying to set you and me right side up in an upside down world. And pretty much everything he's saying to us in an upside down world sounds like crazy talk. And surely consider it all joy when you face various kinds of trials sounds like crazy talk. But if you go down just a little bit to the end of verse 4, it gets a whole lot better. Verse 4b, which would be the back half of the verse, says this. So that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Who wants to be mature? All of us do. Who wants to be complete? All of us do. Who would like to be able to say about our lives, I'm not lacking anything in my personal development as a follower of Jesus. I'm actually growing into the person he had in mind in the first place. We all want that result, but that result begins up with the process, and the process is a little bit challenging. He says in verse 3, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature, this is what we want, and complete, not lacking anything. So we see the result. And then we see the process, and then that's where we say, well, I might be okay if I lack a few things. <laughs> I might be good if I'm not like fully, completely, totally mature, just like kind of sort of mature. Because if the process is trials, trials test, test produces, and what it produces then allows me to become mature and complete, I might just be okay to, to be like a, a middle school Christian all my life and not really to be a grown woman or a grown man. But God has a different picture in mind for you today. God is looking at you and he sees something amazing in your life. Anybody been to Florence, Italy? One of the great cities of the world. Anybody been to Florence? Yes, a lot of us have been there. Phenomenal place, my namesake there. Uh, actually, Florence is, and everything you see around Florence is that Florida de lis which would be the French version of the flower symbol that's on the Saints football helmet, which you see all over Florence, but it's not French, it's Italian because it's in Florence. And in Italian, you say that word Florida de lis Giglio, my name, our name. So we love Florence. You walk the streets of Florence and you don't know what you're going to find. You go down to this one little church, one of my favorite places, and Michelangelo is buried there, Galileo is buried there, and Machiavelli is buried there in the same little chapel. You're like, yeah, we got one of those in Atlanta. Uh, <laughs> and so when you go to the academy, you go there to see what? What do you go to see when you go to the academy? Anybody? The David. You go to see the sculpture, David, and we have a photograph of it just because we all need to see it. And everyone goes to the academy to see this phenomenal work of art. But in the academy are also many other works of David's, of Michelangelo's. 
And one of them I brought a photo of today is called The Awakening. And this would be one of the unfinished works of Michelangelo. And this particular one's called The Awakening, obviously, because you can see the person is kind of coming out of the marble, striving, straining to get out of the marble. And about David, most of us have read or learned at some point in our journey that his approach and concept to carving, to sculpting was this. Michelangelo believed the sculptor was a tool of God, not creating but simply revealing the powerful figures already contained in the marble. Michelangelo's task was only to chip away the excess to reveal. That's brilliance. That's different than I've got a piece of marble and I'm going to try to carve something Michelangelo is looking at the marble and says, I see David in there and I'm going to let him out. And so when God, who we sang today here at Cumberland, is my author and my maker, it means that he sees me today in my marble and he's trying to let me out. And what he wants to let out of the marble is a mature and complete version of me. And so how is he going to do that? He's going to clap his hands, snap his fingers, because he's a miracle worker, and voila, I'm going to appear. No. No, he is Michelangelo with a, a mallet in one hand and a chisel in the other. And he's like, I see you in there. And I'm letting you out because you are beautiful and stunning and powerful in the kingdom, gifted and amazing, and you have a destiny beyond your wildest dreams. I'm going to let you out of the marble that is currently you. And we all see the David and say, that's what I want to be. But a lot of us are walking around in this moment looking more like the awakening going, yeah, you can see that I have an arm, but it's not like an arm with a hand. And you can see I have legs, but it doesn't look like I could walk or run. And you can't really see my head yet because it hasn't fully emerged. And yes, I believe in Jesus, but somehow I got stagnated in the process of maturity and completion. And what James is saying is when God is looking at you today, he's looking at the mature, complete version of you. And he's trying to let you out of the marble encasement that you are in today. But here's how he's going to let you out. He's going to let you out with a hammer and a chisel. The two things in our lives that on our prayer list are at the top of the list day by day by day. God, please take away the hammer and please take away the chisel. Please get rid of the hammer and please get rid of the chisel. Oh, and bless our neighbor. And please get rid of the hammer and please get rid of the chisel and please let this plane take off on time. Please get rid of the hammer because if the plane doesn't take off, that's a hammer. And if, we're, if I'm late getting to this meeting, that's a chisel, and I need you to get rid of the hammer and get rid of the chisel. And James says, hey, I want you to consider it all joy when you face these various kinds of trials. Now, if you want to do a little Bible study, dig down a little bit, there's some beautiful things in this text. Number one, James says, he's not saying, hey, if you were to face a trial, I want you to be joyful about it. He's not saying if at some point in your life difficulty comes, then then you should be joyful about that. He's just flat out telling us today, when the trials come, I want you to be joyful. That means you're either in it or it's on the way right now. And there is no theology that you can cook up that can stop that process. And if you do cook up one, you're going to have to cut James 1, 2, 3, and 4 out of your Bible. Because why would you need to consider it pure joy when you face various trials if there's a way in life with God to not have any trials in your life? The chisel and the hammer are the tools of a loving God to get us out of halfway 
and into the full version of ourselves. And he says, when you face them. And the word here, when you encounter them and when you face them is, is an interesting word. It only appears a few times in the Bible and they're, all, they're both uh, negative connotations. The, the word is when you fall into the midst of a trial. When you like fall into the storm. When you fall into the darkness. When you fall into the challenge. When, when, when you're, it's not like, oh, here I go, sailing, rowing, you know, swimming out into the challenge. And they're like, you're in now, boom. And whenever that happens, I want you to be joyful. He talks about various trials. The word in Greek is multicolored. So it's like, you know, when you just go through all the various hues of aggravation. All the various shades of difficulty. An absolute rainbow of disappointment. That's when I want you to consider it all joy. So James is saying, hey, it's not that you you know, your boyfriend broke up with you and man, the world came to an end and that's terrible. So I want you to count it all joy. He's like, no. Oh, so you're, you backed over a nail and your tire was flat as you were on the way to the biggest presentation you've had at work in the last few months. And therefore you had to get an Uber, but your Uber driver went to the wrong apartment building and not to your apartment building. And by the time they found you, you'd already got another Uber, but then you got confused about the Uber and then you got late to the meeting. And when you got to the meeting, you walked straight in and knocked a coffee over onto your boss's lap. That's a good day to start rejoicing when you leave the meeting and say, man, this day could not get any worse. I backed over a nail. The Uber guy couldn't find my apartment building. I came in in a huff. I knocked my boss's coffee into her lap. And then at the end of the meeting, I walked out. I got a text and it was Elroy telling me, that we need to talk. And James says, oh man, what a day. You got problems coming in all the great colors. Count it all joy. You're like, whew, I don't know if I need the Greek or not. I think the English has given me enough trouble. And I'm just being facetious, obviously, unless you did knock your coffee in your boss's lap. And it probably was a bigger deal than we all made it to be. But I'm talking about cancer and family strife. I'm talking about hardship, disappointment. And I was just thinking back and just a, a little Rolodex of the last few years in our nuclear family's life, Shelley's family and my family. And I made a, a short list. And on that list in our lives, so I don't know about your lives, you, you're probably not going through all that kind of stuff, maybe. But just so you know, the preacher today, we, we've been through addiction, death. We've been through marital separation, disability, brain disease. We've been personally attacked, publicly attacked, We've been all over the news and in the media being attacked. We've had real storms like the kind where lightning strikes people and they have to go to the hospital. We've been through divorce. We've been through several bouts with cancer, one that we're through and one that we're in. We've been through depression. We've been through Parkinson's disease. And that's just the top of the list. And James is saying, if you were to face a multicolored front of all kind of trials, you should take great joy in that. 
And I ask and you ask, why should I take great joy in a smorgasbord of pain and difficulty? And James says, because you know something. That's why. He says down in the next line, because looking at verse three, because you know, that's a, a key a key promise. You know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. You know all those people that we look up to, the heroes in our lives? Isn't it true that almost every one of their stories is a story of perseverance? I was watching a sporting event this weekend and they were telling the story of the mom of one of the people involved in this event and how as a single mom, she had three jobs to provide for her family, to make sure that they got to go to this certain school, to make sure that they had this certain path toward opportunity, to teach them about character, to teach them about what it means to be men and women of, of substance in the world. And the person was just talking about how my mom is my hero and the story was a story of total perseverance. And we know in many, many ways in life that the perseverance has an extraordinary payoff and it makes it worth it in the process. And James is saying, and you know that, right? You know that the testing of your walk with God, of your faith in God, it produces something it develops something in your life and the something it develops is worth the process. In other words, the process has a promise and the pain has a purpose and the promise and the, and the payoff, the purpose is perseverance. Now, the word perseverance here in the Greek means the ability to stay up under something. And so what's being developed in you and me is a strengthening component that allows us to stay under whatever comes our way in life. And the picture is we get stronger and stronger and stronger. Some of you are out, you know, training to run a 10K or, or maybe even training to run a marathon or maybe you're nuts and you're training for a triathlon right now. And maybe there was a day in your life where you thought, I don't know if I can run a mile. Anybody been there where you're thinking, I'm gonna start running. And then you get out there and you're like, whoo, a mile is a lot further on foot than it is in a car. <laughs> Anybody been there and you're like, I am a, a wimp. I cannot run one mile. And then you finally ran the mile and were like, whew, okay, I, I walked a little bit, but I ran a mile. And then you kept at it and you kept at it and you kept at it and you kept at it. And now you're running about four and a half miles and you're laughing at yourself after the one mile mark going, I remember like about three months ago, I could barely run a mile. But you stayed at it and the testing the process, the chiseling, because you didn't love it all, but you stayed at it and you embrace the pain and you embrace the process and the promise. And now once you're into the third mile and the fourth mile, you're starting to go, golly, there was a day I, I, I couldn't really even think about hardly like going out there and running a mile without being completely exhausted and out of breath but you persevered. And when you persevered, you develop the ability to stay up under that pressure. And now you can take the pressure of four miles. You can take the pressure, some of you, of six miles. Some of you can take the pressure of eight miles. Some of you can take the pressure of 15 miles. Some of you can take marathon pressure. But you didn't walk out on day one with the kind of perseverance you need to take marathon pressure. You had to develop that step by step by step by step by step. And you embrace the promise and you embrace the pain. And now you're living with this ability. It's kind of like 
these, these guys in CrossFit lifting these enormous weight, you know, and you think, man, if I did that, first thing that would happen would be I couldn't get it off the ground and that would be humiliating. If I did, I would snap my back in two. If my back didn't get snapped in two and I got it right here, both my thighs would break. And if those, that didn't happen, when I put it up there like that, both my shoulders would break and it would fall on my head and I would die. That is the process that would happen. But these guys didn't start with all that weight. They started by building up the process of, of that word being able to stay under the pressure. So now when they put that weight over their heads, they're able to be complete and mature. And they don't lack anything necessary in that moment to be under that weight. And this is the process that God is doing in you. We always talk about the external benefits of suffering. It, it's for the glory of God. People can see Jesus in me. People can see how God is at work in my life when I'm going through a hard time. But it's not about the external only. It's also about the internal. It's how God's going to make you the person he wants you to be. And it's worth it. I was talking to this guy a few days ago who has a half sleeve on his arm, a uh, tattoo. And you can tell that it's not finished yet because the second half just has like the sketching of what it's going to be. So it looks really fantastic right now. Um, beautiful up here, got some multicolor stuff going on. And then all this down here is just kind of like, this is what we're going to fill in later. And I said, man, that is amazing. And can you explain all that to me? And why did you get that? And what is this? And what does it mean? And why are you doing this down here? Person was very happy to tell me the whole story and to tell me that so far they'd invested 15 hours in getting this done. And they thought they had about six to, to 10 more getting this done. And I said, does it hurt? They said, oh, it hurts like heck. Do you have any tattoos? And I said, well, not any recently, no. <laughs> now you're like, do you have any tattoos? <laughs> yes. I have Chris Tomlin, Matt Redman, and David Crowder on my back. It's across my back. It's amazing. But I... I said, you got 10 more hours to go of pain. He's like, well, it's not that bad. I mean, you get used to it. I was like, how long does it take to get used to it? Well, you never get really used to it. <laughs> but, but I said, well, you would say, but it's worth it. He said, oh yeah, 100%. I'm gonna go sit for 20 hours plus in pain so that I can have a story of my life on display. I was like, you know, it's so amazing that you're willing to do that and you are paying someone to do that. When myself and the average Christian says to God, don't, don't do anything painful to me. Number one and two prayer, no pain. <laughs> Please take the pain. Please stop the pain. Please don't, not, not to chisel. Please not, not to hammer. Please, please no more chiseling, no more pain, no more difficulty. When the guy sitting next to me who is not thinking about eternal things said, oh, absolutely, I am subjecting myself to a lot of pain because this thing is absolutely gonna be worth it. And I was like, man, come on, James, keep talking to me, keep talking to me, keep helping me understand that the pain is worth it, that the process is worth it, that the promise is worth it, that I might actually get to be where I'm kind of going counterflow, where I'm right side up in an upside down world, where I'm talking crazy talk like, God, it's okay if you need to use the chisel and the hammer today because I want out of this marble and I want to be the full version of me. The version that looks the most like you in this world. I want to be mature. That, that word kind of connotes my full potential and complete connotes and having learned everything and added everything possible to my full potential to be even my greatest potential. I want to see what you see, God. 
And I want to be able to count it all joy, no matter what I'm going through in my life. So let me just give us a few practical things. How can we then adjust? Because notice at the end of James, in verse 22, it says, do not merely listen to the word, we've done that so far, and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man or woman who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at his face in the mirror and then going away, immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man or woman who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he or she will be blessed in what he does. In other words, today I cannot get by with walking out today and going, man, we heard a big word on rejoicing in trials. This is normal church life. It's that Beth Moore thing again. I saw it on Twitter. I know no one's on Twitter anymore, except all the crazy people, which is why no one's on Twitter anymore. So if you're on Twitter, I'm not. <laughs> oh, I tweet occasionally, but Twitter used to be a big thing, especially before Instagram came along. And you would see something that someone tweeted, something like this quote, which is mostly attributed to Charles Spurgeon, but I don't think Charles Spurgeon ever said it, but don't let that ruin your devotional life. I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. That's a tweet. And then what I would do is go, I'm gonna retweet that. <laughs> How many retweets did I get on my retweet? And I remember Beth Moore saying, friends, we need to eat it before we tweet it. I'm gonna go with you. I'm gonna go with you. I'm not gonna stop you. We need to eat it and then maybe next month, tweet it. In other words, don't just hear this message today, count it all joy whenever an array of hardship comes your way. He's saying actually count it all joy when an array of hardship comes your way. Actually, let's start doing that today. So a few practical things. Number one, get ready so that when the hardship comes, you won't fall prey to the most common trap in Christianity, which is saying, why is this happening to me? Just get ready today so that when the various trials come, you go, I knew they were coming. I knew this was coming. I knew this was gonna be a part of the process. I knew this was gonna be in the story. I didn't know what, I didn't know when. I didn't, it's not a self-fulfilling prophecy. I didn't default to, well, it's all gonna be bad because we live in a broken world. I just knew that God told me hard times were coming. In fact, Jesus said in the world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And I believe Jesus when he said that. So here comes some of the tribulation. I already knew this was coming. So I can jump over the, why is this happening question and then I can just go, God, what do you want to do? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing, God? Because I'm here for you. Get ready, church. I want to talk about that in just one second. Number two, practically, thank God for the hardship that you're in right now. That's what being endure the word, not a hearer. You're like, I'm not gonna do that. That sounds like a lack of faith. And I believe God's a miracle worker and God's gonna change the situation. Look, James never says anywhere in this letter and in this book, hey, just let it be what it is and don't ask God to change any situations and hardship. 
But that's not the same thing as saying, God, I'm in a hardship right now. And instead of despising it, I'm actually gonna do what you asked me to do. And I'm gonna count it all joy. Because I know something. And what I know is you're making me mature and complete through this process. This is the way you make me mature and complete. And so I'm gonna thank you for this hardship. Thank you that my Uber driver is clueless. Thank you, God. I, I, now I'm gonna find a solution real fast, but thank you for this little moment. Cause man, I just cussed and I'm thinking if I cuss over that, I am not growing up fast enough to be like Jesus. I just yelled at a pregnant woman. I am not growing up as fast as I need to be to be like Jesus. I just fell into a fit on the floor like my four-year-old does because they were out of my particular brand of skin lotion at the CVS and I have to go to Target. Hallelujah. I am not growing up fast enough. Boy, someone at work criticized me and you would have thought World War IV had started. I am not growing up as fast as I need to be growing. Thank you, God. And when we thank God for the hardship, we take control of the story. And instead of being a victim floating down a current in a process and pain, we now are actually writing the narrative of the story and the process and the pain. The third practical thing, just two more really fast. We need to reshape our view of hardship. In God's sovereign timing and grace, this week, I had the most interesting encounter with a homeless woman and James got all up in my grill and I met Andrew Brunson. I had dinner with him on Tuesday night. And you may not know that name, but here we are sitting at dinner. We're taping a TV show. He's taping a show and I'm taping a show back to back. We're having dinner together before the shows are taped. I'm taping a show on Not Forsaken. I feel great about it. I'm like, what are you taping your show on? Well, I just released my book. It's called God's Hostage. I was in a prison in Turkey for 735 days, a pawn of the president of Turkey. He's facing three life sentences with no parole on all trumped up charges. And what, 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 what was my first thought, anybody? Consider it pure joy. My brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, that's more about what James had in mind than the fact that I backed over a nail in my driveway. In the church right now in America, we are napping. <laughs> and we're like, oh, trials. I'm glad we're having a message on trials. Because I ordered this, this um, sweater from Madewell. And, and then when it came, it was a large, but I'd ordered a medium. And so I went back online to send it back because I'd ordered the medium and they'd sent me the large and they were out of the medium when I went back to send it back. They had already sold out of the medium ones. Well, they had it in brown, but I wanted it in black. And the brown one was a crew neck and I'd ordered the V-neck. And so I called him and said, look, I ordered the medium crew neck. Oh, wait a minute, consider all joy when you encounter various trials of different kinds, because this testing of my faith, it is, it's producing perseverance in me. Made well is working for me today. I, I'm gonna, and I'm like, hi, Andrew, I'm Louie, I'm an idiot. I'm a wimp. I am a nearsighted, short-sighted, Atlanta living, Western thinking, misunderstanding, still growing follower of Jesus. Because I lost sight of the fact that this letter was written in the shadow of the cross of Christ and in the wake of his resurrection when the church exploded out of the death of Stephen and was scattered 
into the known world to tell people Jesus was alive because this was the most important news that could be shared on planet earth to a human being. And on the way, it ain't gonna be easy, but don't you worry, God's gonna use the whole process, even 735 days in a Turkish prison to make you mature and complete so that you won't lack anything in your life. You will be able to do and be the full version of who God created you to be. So I'm just preaching to me and I'm preaching you to you today. We need to redefine our idea of what trials and suffering and hardship and difficulty are because getting your latte order wrong at Starbucks does not qualify. Amen. So God help us because we're going into challenging days, church. We're going into difficult times. And God is promising us, don't you worry about those trials. In fact, you should expect them, but more than that, you should be happy about them because they're going to bust you out of that marble and make you everything you were created to be. And then lastly, I'll close with this. Practically for me, I've been trying to get my head around this phrase. Let the pain and let the trial and let the hardship cause me to lean on Jesus, not blame on Jesus. Let, let the hardship cause me to lean on Jesus, not blame on Jesus. Instead of going, God, why are you doing this? Go, God, man, I need you more than ever right now. I'm just going to lean in like I never have. And then you might go, oh, maybe that's why you put me through this hard time, because this is right where you wanted me to be. You know, there's a lot of weird theology in church that isn't in the Bible, like God will never put you in a situation you can't handle. Wrong. God loves to put you in situations you can't handle. But he will never put you in a situation that he can't handle. He'll never put you under trial that he can't handle. He'll never put you under persecution that he can't handle. He'll never put you in a crucible or a fire or a furnace or a trial that he can't handle. And that's the whole point of us maturing and becoming complete is coming to that full wisdom revelation and understanding that Jesus is enough in me to do anything and everything that I'm ever gonna be called on to do and to be in this world. Therefore, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be glad about this hardship right now and I'm gonna let the hardship cause me to lean on Jesus. I am not gonna let the enemy use the hardship to make me blame it on Jesus. Because my Jesus, Man, you talk about considering all joy. He said, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and is now sat down at the right hand of God. Count it all joy, church. Not if you get in any multicolored web of trials and difficulty, but when they come, let's start thanking God for them. And maybe that'll speed up the work. I don't know. God's timetable is always weird. But maybe he chisels a little faster when we cheer on the chiseler. <laughs> then when we're squirming like crazy. <laughs> You're like, son, I need you to be still. I'm just trying to get this splinter out of your foot and yeah I'm poking on you with a needle but it's just going to last another second or two and then daddy's going to pull that out but as long as you're squirming and kicking me in the face with both feet we, we, we're going to be here a minute because I'm getting the splinter out and I wonder sometimes if I, if I might be better off just going, well, I don't like this hammering and chiseling business, but I do want to be the full version of me. So give me the grace today just to not squirm and let you work because the negativity needs to go and the faith needs to arise. That critical spirit that needs to be chiseled out and a more faithful spirit 
needs to be in play, that short-sightedness. I need to lose that and I need a bigger view of what you're doing in the world.